Hello and uh, welcome to another video today with myself, Dr. James Gill. However, I'm going to be joined by uh, a guest today, Andy Stein. So we're in the times of COVID, so we are a socially distanced two metres apart for this interview with Dr. Andy Stein, one of the uh, acute and renal physicians at uh, one of the super hospitals around here. And we're going to be trying something new. This is one of Andy's big ideas and he has an awful lot of them. Um, we're going to try and do an A to Z, or perhaps an ABC, of the NHS, looking at what words we're usually using behind the scenes in the NHS, and medically speaking. And we thought we'd try and address some of those and see you know, if we can do something to help everyone at home understand a little bit more about how the NHS works and what we see in it. So, this is going to be an evolving series and it's going to be vital uh, that we get some input from yourselves on how things are going and how we can change what we're going to be covering over hopefully uh, the next few months to benefit and provide you guys more effective um, information and help. So, Andy, um, just fill us in some of your background. So, uh, James, as you know, I'm a hospital doctor. I'm what's called a consultant physician. And I work at a big hospital in Coventry called UHCW. I've been there a long time, 20 years, and I've known you quite a long time as well. OK, so to be fair, um, Andy, is, he's underselling himself here. He's one of the big dogs, OK? And part of that is that he is involved in the medical school. He taught me when I was here as one of the students. He is involved in so many of the committees and things. And the renal team are always looked at as some of the most skilled in a hospital because of how they deal with the whole patient. And because, as I'm sure you'll rightly say, you know, the kidney is so very vital to everything, not just the ability to produce we. Well, I would say that, wouldn't I? Uh, the kidney is my favourite organ, the organ that I've spent my life studying and treating patients with, but it is only one organ. Uh, most human beings also need a heart and some lungs and a brain. I know, no, no, I know plenty of consultants that don't have hearts. They deal quite well without them. OK. Let's move on to the uh, A to Z of the NHS, and we're going to do A's today. So first, what are, we, uh, what are we going to go with for the first? Well, we're going to start off with atrial fibrillation, uh, move on to arterial blood gas. That one's going to be stabby. Yes. Then adverse drug reactions. Um, and then finally, my favourite subject, which is autoimmune disease. That sounds good to me. Now, I, I'm particularly interested how that autoimmune side of things is going to go, because that's quite a complicated um, an area. So that, that'll be a really interesting one, I think. OK, would you like me to start with that one or start with atrial fibrillation? Oh, no, we, 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 want, you know, we want to hold that in reserve. That, that's going to be okay. our, our okay. jewel on this one. So let's start at the top then with our atrial fibrillation, shall we? Andy, what is an atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation, or as we in the trade call it AF, is the, cool like is the commonest disturbance of the heart rhythm. But to understand it, you have to understand what normal is. So the normal human heartbeat is 60 to 80 beats a minute, and it's regular, like this. So a sinus rhythm. What we call sinus rhythm. But in some people, you can develop a fast or sometimes slow irregular heartbeat and that would feel more like this. It's random um, and some patients can feel they've got it but many patients don't feel they've got it. So a lot of the public have this and don't know. In other words, it's, it's a silent arrhythmia. So when you say a lot of patients can have it and some don't, they're the patients, correct me if I'm wrong, who come to me in the GP surgery and say, I can feel my heart beating, they'll talk about palpitations. That's correct, is it? Yeah, that's right. So um, they will feel an abnormal sensation in their chest, um, which is called a palpitation, because you normally don't really feel your heartbeat, but if it's irregular, sometimes you can, and they feel a sort of fluttering uh, around where the heart is. So as you said, we can have uh, that regular heartbeat, one, two, one, two, or an irregular one, one, two, four, five, one, two, four, all over the place. But apart from one sounding much nicer and regular, what does it matter? 
It matters because atrial fibrillation is a risk factor for stroke. In fact, 20% of patients who have a stroke have atrial fibrillation as a cause of that stroke. Now, as you know, and as I know, and hopefully most of you know, a stroke can be a devastating disease. And I think this is the bit that we really want to hammer home today with regard to atrial fibrillation. There are lots of reasons you can have a stroke, but atrial fibrillation, 50% of those patients have catastrophic strokes. It's a huge, huge problem. In fact, that stroke uh, could be devastating to the point of causing your death, which is generally a bad thing. Um, it can make you unconscious. It can give you complete weakness or paralysis down one side of the body. It can affect your vision. It can affect your voice. It can affect your language. So a stroke is a really bad thing. And if there's anything we can do to prevent it, it's a good thing. And I think that's really, really important to highlight, that with regard to atrial fibrillation, we can recognise this disease, and we've got treatments for the disease, so not only can we control the problem with the heart, but we can reduce greatly the number of people that have a stroke as a result of this problem. And the reason we need to do that is it's very, very common. In fact, about a million people in the United Kingdom have AF, and many of them don't know they're in AF, and that's because the AF is neither particularly fast nor particularly slow. And that's bad, but when you look at the over 65s, in fact, 7% of people over 65 have AF. That's a large number of people. Really large. So we don't want them to have strokes. Mm -hmm. Now, I imagine we'll be covering stroke when we do the S's. Hopefully. And that's going to rely on you guys because we need the feedback on this video. If it's good, if it's working well, if you're getting something out, say down below. We can adjust these because we've got, you know, hopefully a whole alphabet's worth of these to do. Before I tell you how we prevent a stroke, the first thing you have to do is make the diagnosis, which is relatively easy. An experienced doctor can make the diagnosis by examination, though you would always do an ECG to confirm the diagnosis. Um, most patients probably don't need to be referred to a specialist, a cardiologist. Most could be dealt with by most doctors like yourself, a GP, or myself, a physician. Um, and there's two types of drug that a patient may well need. The first type of drug is to control the fast, irregular heart rate. And we use a very traditional drug called digoxin. Uh, and then another drug called a beta blocker, and an example of that would be bisoprolol, for example. Actually, I think this because we're going to talk about ADRs in a minute, adverse drug reactions. Wasn't Van Gogh on digoxin? Was he? I think so, because doesn't digoxin give you a yellow tinge to your vision? Can it? Yes, and I think that's why all of Van Gogh's paintings have a yellow tinge to it, because he was on digoxin. Really? And does that explain why he cut his own ear off? Oh, that's psychiatric. I don't do so. That's I don't do so. not our problem, not our problem. Anyway, moving on from Van Gogh to the modern age, um, we've talked about controlling the heart rate with drugs like digoxin and bisoprolol. And then we've talked about the tendency for patients in AF to have a stroke. But we can stop them having a stroke by giving a drug to thin the blood. Traditionally, we use an old-fashioned drug called warfarin. I'm not a big fan of warfarin. Rat poison. We've got much better stuff today. So now we can see the difference between my age and James's age. Through most of my career, uh, warfarin's been the only drug available, and so we thought it was OK. But when I say OK, to be honest, it's a nightmare. Um, the patient has a regular blood test to make sure that the blood levels of warfarin are neither too high nor too low. The patient must avoid alcohol. And there are a load of other drugs that interact with warfarin, in other words, affect warfarin, either making warfarin too powerful or not powerful enough. So it's a bit of a nightmare, warfarin. And with that, I, I just want to... I give a contrast to my broad uh, brushstroke that warfarin is a, uh, a horrible drug. There are patients that need warfarin, and that, that's fine. When it comes to a patient, as doctors, we choose the best thing for each individual patient. And there are some patients that can't use the newer medications for whatever reason, in which case we're choosing 
uh, warfarin there because it's the best option for that patient. So it definitely does have a good role and is vital for many patients. It's just that we do have other better medications where they can be used. So one of those better medications and the newer drugs is called a NOAC, N-O-A-C or DOAC, D-O-A-C. Uh, these are tablets like warfarin, but they have one huge advantage. You don't have to have regular blood tests. They're also more consistent in many ways. So we can predict roughly how thin the patient's blood will be without the regular blood tests. And it, it gives the patient more freedom for their life. So you, know, you can eat a diet without worrying about interacting with you know, your medication in terms of the way it will with warfarin. The NOACs, life is easier, I think. Yeah, they're a really great advance. So our patient with atrial fibrillation, um, or most patients with atrial fibrillation, will end up on a drug to control the heart rate and also a drug to thin the blood. And if we can do that, we can, in most of them, prevent them from having a stroke, which is a good idea. Hence why, as Andy said at the start there, so many patients may have atrial fibrillation and not know about it. So what's one of the things that a patient might experience having atrial fibrillation that might be the reason for them to come and talk to us? Good question. Um, like you say, often they don't know, and it's something a doctor may pick up on a routine examination. But if they do have a symptom, it could be palpitations. That's when they feel their heart rate, and they may even feel it being fast and irregular and tell you so. Um, they may be short of breath, um, though that's unusual unless the heart rate is very fast. Or they may just feel generally weak and not right. And I think that gives an idea about how vague some of these things can be. But even the palpitations, we've all got our hearts beating away in our chests, but we're not aware of that fact. If I blast up the hill here at the medical school, I'm going to be aware of my heart beating in my chest, and that's fine. But if you're sat at rest and you can feel your heart in your chest, that might be a good reason to have a chat to somebody. One of my concerns about COVID and when this COVID world is most of our appointments are now virtual in other words on the telephone or sometimes on a video and it does concern me that doctors like you and me are not examining the patients as much as we used to because sometimes things like AF are picked up on routine examination and I expect you've picked that up many times in your general practice. You're absolutely correct with that and that's why I say, we need to speak to you, we need to hear from you. There's lots of things that we will pick up, but at the moment, if there's something unusual, if there's something that doesn't feel right, don't sit on it, speak to your doctors. Yes, we've got a lot of telephone triage, we've got a lot of viewing people, but the practices are still open, and if needed, we will see you and we will put a hand on the, uh, your uh, arm, we'll check your pulse, we'll listen to your chest, we will care for you but we can't do it if we don't know that you've got a problem. Absolutely, and I think uh, the public should know that hospital doctors like myself, GPs like you, are going to work. We are seeing patients. Yes, there are small risks to us, but we're using PPE and other things to reduce the risk of COVID, but we are still there, and it's very important the public come forward if they have a complaint. I think they might have atrial fibrillation or, or in fact, anything. Well, I think that's probably a good point to move from atrial fibrillation because we're going into a, a bigger C, COVID, which I think will probably a video all on its own. So what else have we got on the list for so A's? So next on my list is something slightly painful, painful uh, in many ways, uh, called ABG or arterial blood gas. These were the bane of my life as a junior doctor. Not because I'm not good at them, I was fabulous. I just don't like causing pain to people. Yeah, uh, pain's a strange thing. Um, we don't really understand pain. Uh, we've all had pain, we've seen patients with pain. We know it's not nice. But one thing as a doctor you don't want to do is cause pain. And unfortunately, uh, when one does an ABG, as you've done in the past and I've done a few, well, a few thousand, um, you do cause pain. And maybe we'll talk about in a minute why they cause pain. 
But first of all, let's talk a bit about what an ABG is, an arterial blood gas. So this is when a doctor like myself or yourself or a nurse takes a sample of blood from an artery. Now most blood is taken from a vein and I expect you do that, don't you James? Yeah, I'm d I still do that when needed in the practice. Uh, as, even as a doctor, I think it's important to keep my skills up and it's actually nice to be able to do something there and then for the patient. But I won't be doing an ABG in the practice because it's quite different. So when James in his general practice takes a normal blood sample, it's from a vein, usually in this area, which doctors call the anticubital fossa or elbow. And he will take blood quite simply with little pain to yourself, the patient. He will not do an arterial blood sample. Uh, and that is usually done in hospital by somebody like me or one of my many hundreds of juniors, because I haven't done one for 20 years. Um, and we take this from an artery here called the radial artery. Ouch. And I think that ouch is probably for two reasons. As we say, going into a vein doesn't hurt particularly. There's a small scratch, yes. But the veins are relatively thin, whereas the arteries have got a much thicker wall, so piercing the needle through is much more painful. But because the, um, the artery there is sitting so close to the bone, it's not unusual to actually go into the artery, through the artery, and scratch the bone on the other side. Whereas that's not going to happen when we're doing a venous blood sample instead. Sadly, I've done that uh, many times to a patient, and uh, I don't like doing it, but you certainly learn a few new swear words uh, when you do that to a patient. Anyway. But something so painful, why, you know, why would we do this? Is it really that important? Well, yes it is. When either a patient is obviously extremely unwell or you think they might be extremely unwell, one way to confirm that impression is to do an ABG and that gives you three important pieces of information. Uh, and they are the level of oxygen in the blood, the level of carbon dioxide and the pH. That's the marker of acidity of the blood. And those three things really tell you a lot about the patient and how unwell they are. Other things also come out of it like the amount of glucose and something called lactate in the blood, something called potassium, which is a mineral in the blood, but it's primarily the oxygen, the carbon dioxide and the pH. So what do you do? Well, you get uh, a little kit, uh, you attach uh, a sharp needle uh, to a syringe, a small syringe. You ask the patient to do that. You may even have a nurse to hold the patient's hand down. Uh, and then you put the needle in there. Um, now, because of the pressure of the blood in the artery, you actually rarely need to suck blood out. It actually forces uh, itself out into the syringe. Then comes the hard bit, which is removing it and then stopping the bleeding where the needle went in. So you need to be quite quick uh, and put some form of dressing. And at this point, it's helpful to have an assistant who can put their finger on the dressing. So we've all had blood samples taken and frequently we'll get a bruise under the skin. That's simply because blood has leaked into that area. It's called extravasation. But we can prevent that. When I'm doing a, a blood test myself on patients at the practice, as soon as I remove the needle, I make sure they press down as hard and as long as they can to reduce the chance of getting a bruise. And that's just as Andy was saying, after the ABG has been taken, by putting pressure on there, we're hopefully going to reduce the chance of getting that painful bruise there as well. So what do you do next? You take your sample away to a machine, an ABG machine, which hopefully is nearby, though I must admit, um, I have worked in hospitals when it's another building, and you have to run across the car park uh, in the snow with your syringe uh, to put it into a machine in another building, but fortunately uh, that doesn't happen very much in, in the modern age. Um, and then you put the sample of blood into the machine, wait a few seconds, and then you get a readout, usually in the form of a small bit of paper, telling you the patient's oxygen, carbon dioxide, pH, and, and other things. Um, so that's what it's all about. Um, when do we do them? Um, well, basically when a patient is very sick, 
Um, you wouldn't normally have an arterial blood gas, but it's a very good test, what I call a trouble at mill test, whereby if you think a patient is definitely very sick or you think a patient might be very sick but you don't know really what's wrong with them, it's a very good test to start with because if the oxygen levels are down or the CO2 levels are up or the pH, the acidity of the blood is down, the pH down means that the blood is acidic, um, that's a sign of very bad ill health. Uh, I mentioned earlier the thing called a lactate. That is an extremely good sign of ill health. And if that's significantly raised, the patient's in serious trouble. And as a junior doctor, you would know to call the cavalry at that point. And that's why we often find the ABG machine in three places in the hospital, on the surgical admission ward, in the A&E department, and in ITU, because that's where we've got the sickest patients. So I think that's about it for ABGs. We probably haven't got time today to go into the nuances of what you do if the oxygen is down or the CO2 is up, but I think you get the general picture of what it's all about. Okay, so we've got atrial fibrillation, we've got the slightly squeeze-inducing ABG. What else is on our list? So the next one um, is something I feel quite passionate about, and that's an ADR, an adverse drug reaction. It's not just a side effect. It is, it's kind of a fancy name for a side effect of a drug, uh, and it's, if you like, the technical doctor's name. Um, and if you remember from your Hippocratic Oath that you took in the uh, 5th century BC... I've not got that much grey! Uh, you will remember something about do no harm. And unfortunately, back in the 5th century BC in Athens, and now, there's a very dangerous thing that a doctor has in their armory and it's this um, and we use pens hopefully with clear writing um, and utter rubbish last day of medical school congratulations here's your graduation lump hammers to the fingers none of us can write that's why we type everything now it's a lot safer than we've started typing if only we could spell um, anyway um, so this is a very dangerous thing and why in your Hippocratic Oath you said do no harm um, and that's the problem with many drugs that are used in Western medicine both in an acute setting when a patient is very ill or in a general practice setting they, they really all have risks as well as benefits so that's what an ADR it's an unpredicted or sometimes predicted adverse, in other words, abnormal drug reaction. Now you say they're about having a, a benefit and a disadvantage. I'm sure the one that everyone at home is used to is vomiting and diarrhea after you've had an antibiotic. We've given you that antibiotic to try and clear up a, a, an infected cut or perhaps dealing with a chest infection, but we've given you new symptoms as a result of the positive effect that that's having. So with the antibiotic, we're killing the bacteria, but probably also decimating your good bacteria in the gut, which is why you end up with a bit of a, a dicky tummy. There's an adverse drug reaction that I've seen uh, several times uh, when I was a junior doctor and a middle grade doctor long ago, uh, and it relates to a very common drug, which many of you will have taken, called paracetamol. As you know, paracetamol is a very good drug. Uh, most of you will have taken it at some point in your lives. It's a very commonly used drug. You use it for headaches, fevers, flu-like illnesses. Hangovers. Hangovers. You've never had one of those, James. Um, and also, you probably will have given it to your children to help them sleep at night if they've got a fever, for example, in the form of cowpole. But the big but is, in overdosage, and you may not deliberately take an overdose, it can kill you. It's actually quite shocking how easy it is to overdose with paracetamol. So the usual dose is two tablets, four times a day, so eight in total. I personally have had a patient who has died from taking 10 tablets of paracetamol, just that small difference. Now admittedly, they'd done 10 a day for a few weeks, but nevertheless, most people would think that's not a big difference, but paracetamol, the dose is very specific. So my story about paracetamol, uh, and it's quite a sad one, uh, it's about a young woman in her late teens that I looked after some years ago, 
um, who had an argument with her boyfriend. Now, we all have arguments with our boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands and wives, but it's important not to take paracetamol. She didn't really want to die. What she wanted to do was to get her boyfriend back. So she took, quote, too many paracetamol, but it wasn't that too many. It was only 20-ish tablets um, in a 24-hour period. And she woke up a week later having had a liver transplant. Um, so that's pretty devastating uh, for a, a young woman, in fact, for a person of, of any age. Um, the story goes on. Um, she got out of hospital. Um, she was put on various drugs, including a drug called cyclosporin, to prevent her rejecting the liver. Um, and then a couple of years later, went into kidney failure, um, had dialysis treatment, and I looked after her when she'd had a kidney transplant. So this young woman made a mistake several years earlier in her life and ended up with initially a liver transplant secondary to a paracetamol overdose and a kidney transplant secondary to cyclosporine. So we've actually got the two ADRs there. We've got the paracetamol with its liver toxicity and the cyclosporine with the renal toxicity. Absolutely. Um, now, most ADRs are not that bad, but it's very important for all the doctors and nurses out there to report ADRs. And in the UK, we have a system which used to be called the yellow form. And there's a book that most doctors carry or have near to them in some form at all times called the BNF, the British National Formulary. And this is a list of all drugs you can prescribe in the UK. And at the back of the book, there is a yellow form which you can rip out and send to the authorities. And it's important both to record new side effects or known side effects and send that form off. There's also a fancy cyber way of doing it that I'm sure a youngster like you would prefer to do. But it doesn't really matter whether it's a paper form that you send off or, or a cyber form that you send in an email or whatever. Um, it's important that we all do it. And that's how the authorities and drug companies learn about the side effects of drugs. And part of that is almost mathematical. So there's a medication called Ramipril, uh, it's a very good antihypertensive medication, anti blood pressure medication, and it also has some kidney benefits where it protects uh, from uh, the kidney. This is a great medication when it came out, everybody loved it. But some people subsequently developed a cough, but it would happen months and months later after that medication was initiated. And it was only through the yellow card system where people were reporting you know, this patient is on Ramipril and has a cough, that they are actually to make the connection that it was the Ramipril causing the cough. And I have seen this in the last couple of months. I've had a gentleman who has had a cough for about nine months and we've not been able to find a cause from it. But before he came to our surgery, he was started about 12 months ago on Ramipril. So we've ruled out all the other possible causes, we've stopped the Ramipril, and his cough has improved. So that yellow card system has been vital to pinning down side effects that aren't often obvious. That's probably enough on ADRs. I think we should move on to our final A, which is my favourite one, autoimmune disease. Before we can understand autoimmune disease, we need to pause and think about what the immune system is. So the immune system is probably the most important bit of the body and you have to have great faith in it because you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it, but it saves your life every minute of every day. Now, we've all had sore throats and we get lumps in the neck. These are glands or nodes and they go down when the sore throat's better. We also have these glands or nodes in our armpits and in our groins. We also have a liver over here, a spleen, and in the blood there's an army of white blood cells which are like the soldiers of the immune system and their guns are called antibodies and cytokines and things like that. And that immune system exists in us all, works 24 hours a day and protects you against foreign invaders. Those foreign invaders could be, for example, cancer cells. They could be infections like COVID. 
um, or they could be foreign bodies like a splinter, a piece of metal, a thorn in your finger, for example. Either way, those things are not welcome in your body and your body has to try to get rid of them. So one of the ways I've thought about the lymph nodes or the, the, the glands, as you say, is as you say, they're trying to, your immune system is trying to repel a foreign invader. So they send the soldiers, the white blood cells, out, but they need barracks, which is what the lymph nodes essentially work as, like a staging ground to go forwards. So we can find that patients will have lymph nodes in certain areas, which we can then work backwards to try and say, well, hold on, do they have a problem in this region of the body? Uh, absolutely. Now, most of the time, as I say, the immune system's a good thing, but it can turn on the human body. And what's interesting about the immune system is actually why it doesn't, how it knows not to attack your nose or my foot. Uh, but that's a story for another day. We actually don't really understand how it knows what is you and what is not you. What we do know is the immune system can go wonky and become overactive and start sending its soldiers to send antibodies to other bits of the, bo of the normal body, in other words, to attack your normal body. Now that sounds, you know, major league medicine, but actually autoimmune diseases are much, much more common than people think. Think of people who you know yourself, who have had eczema or allergies or asthma. All of these are one form or another of an autoimmune disease. So they can be very, very common. They're always annoying or unpleasant. But as we'll see now, there can be some devastating autoimmune diseases. Absolutely. So you can have a mild autoimmune disease, like you say, eczema, asthma, psoriasis. And these are quite easy to treat or, or may not need any treatment. But autoimmune disease can be a lot more serious. Uh, you can have autoimmune disease of the thyroid gland, of the pancreas gland, which is here, and that causes diabetes, of the joints, such as rheumatoid arthritis, of the bowel, causing ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is a really horrible disease. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. And you can also have autoimmune disease of my favourite organ, the kidney. Okay, now you say about autoimmune conditions of the kidney. I mean, that, that's some major league medicine there. Um, can you give us any simple examples of the autoimmune disease of the kidney? Mm, simple, I'm not Simple sure. not normally goes with kidney. <laughs> that goes with kidney. There are some very rare diseases um, with very long names like Wegener's granulomatosis and polyarthritis nodosa, which fortunately you're very unlikely to see we see very rarely. Um, there are some slightly more common ones, one called lupus that you may have heard of. I think we've all watched House, but we know that lupus is a bad diagnosis. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Lupus is one of my favourite diagnoses, actually. And in fact, uh, when uh, there was a review, in other words, a show done by the medical students, they were very naughty and did a sketch on one of my ward rounds. Apparently, uh, they said I was a bit like House and I used to diagnose lupus, apparently, on every single patient, on every single ward round, even if they had a sprained ankle or an ingrowing toenail. But that's uh, another story. Back to autoimmune disease. Um, so the common aspects to these rare autoimmune diseases of the kidney is that the immune system is overactive and it sends antibodies, cytokines and other guns, if you like, guns and bullets, um, to the small blood vessels inside the kidney. And that can cause either short-term kidney failure, long-term kidney failure, or another a rare kidney disease called nephrotic syndrome. Okay, so in terms of those uh, major league uh, renal issues, is that something that patients can recover from? Yes and no. Um, some of them are very serious indeed and we don't really have any effective treatments for and unfortunately the patients end up on long-term dialysis and then need a transplant. But there is a subgroup that are very treatable and if you get to the patient early, if you make the diagnosis early, if you use strong drugs like cyclophosphamide, that's a drug with a very long name, azathioprine, mycophenolate, and a steroid called prednisolone, you can actually cure the patient of the autoimmune disease.
Now, one of the things that you said uh, early on about the immune system using you know, antibodies and bullets, we do have new and developing drugs that we're using against um, autoimmune diseases, using those antibodies. You know, what, what are those are you working with? Yes, we use uh, a few of those drugs. They're not used as commonly in kidney medicine. They're used more commonly in problems of the gut and bowel, for example, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and in rheumatoid arthritis, for example. And they're generally known as the biological agents. And most of those drugs have to be given intermittently, like once a week or once a month, for example. We use them a bit in my kidney world, but we're not in, in many patients. Okay. So I think that, you know, we appreciate from what you're saying that the autoimmune diseases are of complete range and as with all of these things and I, I want to have this as an underlying message here we're talking today about this you know the approach to the ABC of uh, the NHS because we want to help you guys get more out of your NHS if you understand about the things that we do and if you understand some of the words that we're using perhaps formal words you're more likely to be able to say hold on that applies to me I need help with that so if you do have issues with, you know, the simple autoimmune diseases, eczema, asthma, psoriasis and things like that, don't sit at home and suffer with them saying it's just eczema. Talk to us, we can help. So I think that's probably a good place to wrap up this, the first uh, letter of our um, a uh, ABC on the NHS. Um, please give us some information on how this, you know, you'd like this series to evolve, if you'd like this series to carry on for that matter. You know, what's been useful to you? What could we do to improve it? And, well, essentially, you know, give us other things that you might want us to cover. We've got our lists here, but ultimately we're doing these videos for yourselves at home. Well, on that, thank you, Andy, for uh, giving us this time today, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much, James. Right. Take care, everybody.